Amen. 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 God bless you so much. Okay, we're going to um, stop the music and we are going to uh, get going here on the subject of the meaning. The meaning of true grace. The meaning of true grace and true sanctification. The meaning of true grace and true sanctification. I forgot these walls are yellow, or I would have used a different uh, color on that, but we can read it. Okay, grace by one definition, and and you all have heard me teach on the subject of grace before. I love teaching on the the grace of God. Can I tell you, uh, if it wasn't for the grace of God... Every single last one of us and way beyond, we would be so upside down, turned inside out and goofed up just like we were before grace found us. And so grace is to me of every word in the English language. The most beautiful word is Jesus. And the second most beautiful word is grace. In that order, Jesus and grace are the two most beautiful words in language. So by way of definition, it can be a favor or a kindness shown. Okay, it's shown without regard to the worth or merit of the one who receives it. Pure grace, somebody gives somebody a gift that that they don't even deserve it. There's no merit for it. They just, they just receive it. Uh, that's a definition of it. It's done in spite of what that same person deserves. They may not deserve the kindness shown, the grace shown, the favor shown. And uh, we won't ask for everybody to say amen that believes that, but we just know it's true that it was for that God showed us by his mercy, his grace. Okay, so all of that is usually summed up in the phraseology, it's the unmerited favor of God. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. You don't get it because you're a good guy. You're a good guy because you get it. Amen. And um, I'm glad that even before I knew God, God showed his grace on me. He showed favors on me, sparing my life several times. Um, several times he, he had mercy on me when others that I knew and have hung around with and were friends, um, it just, things happened and it was very, very, very sad, such as the time a guy was shooting at me and the gun jammed. Once he zeroed it in on my back, the gun jammed. That's grace. That was mercy. Another time a guy withdrew three bullets from a six-shot cylinder, and he spun it and pulled the trigger at my back, and I got the blank. And to me, that was the grace of God. And many, many, many such like. Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. I did not deserve it at all. Exodus 34 and 6 gives us this. And the Lord passed by before him, meaning Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He, he's already introduced himself to Moses. Moses has known him for a, a season now, he has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're still in the land, um, the Sinai Peninsula, the wilderness. He wanted to see the glory of God. God said, if you see me in all my glory, basically, you can't see that and live. So hide in the cleft of the rock. And God passed by. And this is what he said. The Lord God, merciful and gracious long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. This is the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Revealing himself and wanting to be known the way he really is. Now, he, he dealt with Pharaoh the only way he could deal with Pharaoh. 
Pharaoh, in my opinion, was, he'd already so denied even the things which nature teaches that he was already turned over. And the, the ugly word is he was already of a reprobate mind before God ever showed up with Moses. So anything, he, he would not listen to entreaties, but to those that will allow God, he wants to show himself merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant, abundant in goodness and truth. That's what he wants. So grace is almost always, the word grace is almost always associated with mercy, love, compassion, and patience. That's, those, are, those are synoptic terms dealing with the word grace associated. It is also the, associated as the source of help and with deliverance from distress. This is as we find it wending and working its way through the scriptures, through the history of the scriptures, through the lives of the characters of the scriptures, and in our lives and in the lives of the kingdom and beyond and beyond the kingdom. Now, New Testament grace, New Testament grace is just as beautiful. The word is charis, from which comes charis or charismatic. Not in the sense of, 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 of the, of the uh, quote, religious movement, but it's, it means a gift, charis. Okay, that's from where charismatic comes from. Uh, and a person can have a charismatic uh, personality, such as John F. Kennedy had a very charismatic personality. They said when he walked into a room, it was like somebody turned the lights on. He just had one of those uh, personalities. There are people like that. Okay, but we're talking religiously. Amen. There's a gift. It's grace in the New Testament. Okay, graciousness as in gratifying or helping. New Testament grace in manner or act. He can work in a manner or act in, in gratifying or helping individuals abstractly. That means like unbeknownst, not overt. He can do it concretely, literally. I mean, it's absolutely wow. It's happened right now. It can be uh, figuratively that bleeds over into mentally or understood figuratively. Figuratively, it can be done, of course, spiritually, and it can be done physically. He shows grace. When he heals somebody, he's showing grace. When he does something like that, he is showing grace. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, especially the divine influence upon the heart. The most important way that God can show grace. You can, you can die of a sickness and go to heaven without receiving healing grace. But when the grace of God has been shown divinely and influences the human heart that it's able to obey and walk in and flourish in his truth, that's special grace. And it works its way out in the reflections in an individual's life, in in almost every, in, I would say in every aspect of life, and especially including gratitude. When someone is gracious in themselves, they appreciate grace. They're thankful for grace. They appreciate kindnesses shown. And people that have no grace on them. No graciousness on them tend to be unthankful people. The more grace you have, the more appreciative you are of God's goodness. So grace, this is one reason it's, it's, it's the second most beautiful word. It is a, a word that has ability to weave its way throughout every aspect of life. I do not know of any aspect of life personally that I do not want or need the grace of God, the flow of God, the blessing of God, the smile of God, the favor of God, whether it's abstractly, concretely, literally, literally, figuratively, spiritually, physically, we need it every way known or unbeknownst to us. 
We have to recognize we need his grace. We need his grace. Okay, several times in the New Testament, in Scripture, both old and new, in the King James, grace is also translated, the same word is translated as favor. As favor, such as Luke one thirty, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Mary, fear not Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And the word is also translated grace with God. You found favor with God. Acts 7, verses 10 and 11. And delivered him, speaking of Joseph, the patriarch, out of all his afflictions, out of the pit, uh, off the auction block, out of Potiphar's house, out of the prison, God delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor. And again, even in the Hebrew, we're speaking of grace. And wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, made him governor over Egypt and all his house. The favor of God was upon him. The grace of God was upon him. Acts seven forty five and 46. Unto the days of David who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. So David was such a recipient of grace in his, and we'll get into this, in his abilities that God gave him. Amen. To kill a bear that would take, dare to take a lamb. To kill a lion that would dare to take a lamb. To kill a giant named Goliath, over nine feet tall, and this is a 17-ish year old kid that is able to take him down because of the favor of God, the smile of God, the grace of God that was upon him. Amen. Grace is a beautiful thing. It also means the favor of God. Proverbs 14 and 9 speaks this. Fools make a mock at sin. And boy, could a guy stop right there. How many understand we are living in a foolish world? They mock at even the concept of people being upset over sin. They revel in sin. They enjoy it. We're not talking about every single person, but, but just the, the world in general. It's a fool that makes a mock at sin. Ah, oh, but among the righteous, there is favor. There is grace. We don't make a mock at sin. We have a respect of the power of sin, of the insidious nature of sin, of the debilitating, devastating, destructive nature of sin. We understand what sin can do. Understand that even a little leaven can leaven the whole lump, the whole loaf. And a little sin, as even a fly in the ointment of the apothecary can send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly. Him that is in reputation of, for wisdom and in honor. And so sin is not something to make light of. Amen. So those that have a healthy respect of the fear of the Lord and an abhorrence for sin, it doesn't mean that we're perfect by no means. But, but one thing about it, if you have that, and if somewhere you stub your toe or crack your knee or fall on your face, a respect will cause a righteous man to get back up seven times and say, God, I, uh, no, 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 no. The Bible says the wicked fall into mischief. We may have stumbled, but we're getting up. No, we're not, we're not staying there. And so we run boldly to the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help, to help in time of need. Mercy to wash and grace to help, to live above it. Amen. Thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. Deuteronomy 33, 23. And of Naphtali, the tribe of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor, blessing, uh, and full of the blessing of the Lord. Favor is grace. Satisfied with grace, full of the blessing of the Lord. I don't want to be in this world without grace. I don't want to be in this world without grace, abundant grace. Do it, Jesus. Do it, God. Amen. Proverbs 8.35, for whoso findeth me, findeth life. This is talking about the wisdom of God 
and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Grace of the Lord. Grace of God. There's something about grace will help you find wisdom and wisdom will help you find more grace. This is why in John 1 it says he gives us grace for grace. He'll give us grace to find more grace. To get more grace. Amen. Grace needs to be like a snowball rolling down a hill that is gathering momentum. And it becomes richer and richer, bigger and bigger. Amen. And more and more powerful. Okay. A further definition of grace. And we're going to get into things that grace does specifically. A further definition. And this is to me the best definition of grace that there is. And I like I like the unmerited favor. I would never discount that. That's crazy. But a further just as sweet and just as important definition is the ability to perform the will of God. When a person has the grace of God upon them, they can do what's right. Without the grace of God, we're going to have a hard time doing what's right. You hear me? Trust me. You say, oh, I don't, I, I'm fine. Well, fine. Let someone slap you across the face and let's see how much grace you got. Amen. Let them back into your car and then speed off. And let's see how much grace you got. You got the picture? We find out pretty easy. We need grace. We need grace. It's the ability to perform the will of God. Amen. The greater the grace, the greater the joy in the performance of that will. Amen. It's when grace is the ability to come to church when you're tired. The greater the grace, you're like, David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Because there's grace on him, in him, on us. Amen. It needs to be that way. Grace helps you pray. Great grace says, ooh, I can't wait to pray. I'm excited about praying. It's beautiful. The more you pray, the more you want to pray. You get grace for grace. It builds. This is why Paul said, I seek not to frustrate the grace of God. I don't want to choke it down. I want to let it flow. I don't want to strangle it. I don't want to quench it. I want to let it flow. I want to let it flow. Amen. And let the snowball get bigger. So the greater the grace, the greater the joy in the performance of that will. Acts 4, 32 and 33. And the multitude of them, this is the early church, that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. This is not a doctrine. This is not a doctrine. This is what was on them. This is what was on them. There was such a spirit of abject, total generosity. Amen. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And it goes on to tell us there was such great grace. Man, those that had houses and lands, they were selling it. They were laying the money at the feet of the apostles. Amen. The gospel was going forth and being preached powerfully, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because of this great grace. It was not a doctrine. The doctrine came when Paul is writing to Timothy. And he said, them that are rich, charge them. Charge them that are rich that they don't be high-minded, meaning proud and lofty. But that they be willing to communicate, willing to be generous, willing to be a blessing. That was doctrine. It's not doctrine. You have to sell your houses. You have to sell your lands. You can. And if God puts that on your heart and you have grace to do it, fine. But this is what grace can do. The grace was there. And and I will stop and say this, and I've said it many times. Why did God do that? Well, for one thing, it threw the kingdom mind-bogglingly, instantly into high gear. It was rocking Jerusalem. Great grace, power, and the things they were doing. Barnabas having 
lamb, sold it, laid it at the apostles' feet. He became one of the first great missionaries of the church. It is said that the household of Barnabas owned most of the island of Cyprus. And that basically he sold, if not all, the vast majority of the island of Cyprus that was in his family's control. He gave it. And look what Barnabas became for God. Okay? So, so, but bottom line is when Titus came with his armies, they ransacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, stripped down the gold, took, when you see the Roman Colosseum, the ruins of it now, but that was a vast Colosseum that provided a place for entertainment. Most of it ribald and wicked and violent for 500 years to the Roman Empire. The Colosseum was built from the ransacking of Jerusalem. That's where they got the money to build the Roman Colosseum was they ransacked Jerusalem. Well, I'm going to tell you some money they didn't get. They did not get the church's money, duh, because they had done giving it away. So I'm just telling you, God knew what he was doing, when and where and how. There was grace on them to do that. Grace on them to do that. And if and somebody's got grace, they, they, they love to do what's right. They love to give. They become generous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's too good a moment to miss this. It's not like the guy that a friend of mine was holding a revival and he saw a guy come to the altar first night and he was squalling, second night squalling, third night squalling. Pastor came walking by. He grabbed the pastor's pant leg. I got to talk to you, please. And they go into the office and he's sitting there sobbing, sobbing. <laughs> do, do, do I have to pay my tithes to be saved? Whatever else you want to say about that, I would say he was, he was lacking in grace. <laughs> he didn't have much grace on him. Grace, it's a joy. It's a joy. When great grace is on you, it's a joy. Trust me. Amen. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. But by the grace of God, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Saul of Tarsus, mean cruel, diabolical, breathing out threatenings and slaughters, became a man in labors more abundant than all of the apostles. He writes, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, over half of the New Testament books, he, he, he changes the course of history. In the top ten lists of the most important people that have ever lived, Apostle Paul's name is always found. I've never seen a list without his name found. And some lists, even wrongly, but they put Paul's influence ahead of that of Jesus Christ. The only reason they do is because they said without Paul, the message of Jesus Christ would have been strangled down. It was Paul that shot out of a cannon and splattered it over the Gentile world. Okay, well, this apostle said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. With, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Now, sometimes God will bestow grace on people, and it's kind of like ends up being useless because they, they throw it away, they twitter it away, they don't appreciate it. They frustrate the grace of God, but it was not frustrated by the Apostle Paul. God bestowed it upon him, and it was not bestowed in vain. He said, I labored, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. It wasn't me that was working so hard, but the grace of God which was with me. That's how I did what I did. It was the grace of God that was with me. In 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, he makes this statement, and God is able... To make all grace abound toward you. That same God can work with me, with you, with everybody. He can make it abound toward you. That ye always, boy that's a word. Always, not just Sunday night at altar call time. Always, Monday morning. 
always, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, always, grace can be with you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, honey, that's grace that does that. That's grace that does that. And grace is able to do that toward all of us. That's what Paul's telling us. It's for us all. 12 and 9, he said unto me, the Lord said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We won't go into all of the backdrop for that verse. Suffice it to say, it's true regardless of our situation. His grace is sufficient. And in our personal weakness, be it emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, financial, or whatever, he's able to give us grace and strength. He's able to help us. This grace makes us sufficient. Amen. And then here we go. Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He was born, taught, healed, ministered, proclaimed, suffered hideously, died ignominiously, was raised gloriously, pours out his spirit magnificently. He didn't die in vain. He did all that to bestow upon us sufficient grace, abundant grace. And we don't want to frustrate that. We want to let it flow. We want the snowball to roll down the hill, grace for grace, getting bigger and bigger and better and better and sweeter and sweeter. That doesn't mean all days are created equal. It doesn't mean that, that, that every day of the week is, is like, every day of the week is like, ooh, man, Tuesday's better than Monday. Ooh, Wednesday's better. There's days that are just not, you know, you got human bodies and you got, you got surprises. Like, for whatever reason, my wife's car won't start. It won't even charge. There's been no problem. Guess what? Welcome to the world. That just, it's, it's called life. There's, there's just stuff that happens. But what do you do? You don't lay on the hood and beat the hood and scream at God. You just say, whatever. God, it's going to be all right. Somebody didn't shake my hand. It's going to be all right. Somebody sitting where I usually sit. It's going to be all right. Somebody took my parking spot. It's going to be all right. Somebody talked about me. Surely not. Surely not. I can't even imagine that. This is the human condition. I don't want to be in this world without grace. I don't want to be in this world. I want grace. I want grace. I want grace. I don't know how hot it is out there. Okay? But grace is a form of shade. He's, uh, he will be a shade upon my right hand. Okay? If you're out there walking in the heat... And you walk in under the, one of the eaves of the church and you stand in the shade. It's not like being in air conditioning, but honey, it ain't like being out in the sun either. Amen. So you can have grace on you. It doesn't mean it's going to be 70 degrees, but it's better than being out in the sun. Are you just following me? Grace, the temperatures of grace, they can, they can, they can chill you. It can bless you, can keep you, it can strengthen you, it can help you. All I know is we need it to motivate our way through the shoals and the rivers of life. And he helps us. Thank God for his grace. And I don't want to frustrate it. Okay? Grace is the ability to do or accomplish the will of God cheerfully. That's what grace is. And the greater the grace, the greater the joy in doing God's will. Let there be great grace upon us all. Now... Here's some things that grace will do, and I'm going to pick this up. Grace, therefore, can, this is number one, bring men to repentance. Amen. When this 19-year-old hippie hit the altar that night and I sobbed 
for like an hour and a half, sobbed and cried and wept and screamed out to God. God's grace was bringing me to repentance. Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Can I tell you, there is... And we know what God did in the early days of the first church in Jerusalem. But can I also tell you there is a day coming in hard Israel in which God is going to pour out the spirit on the house of David and the inhabitants. And there's going to be a spirit of grace come and people are going to start repenting. You hear me? God is going to turn a multitude out of every tribe. My Bible tells me 12,000 out of each tribe. That's just in the last of the last days. 144,000. God is visiting a friend of mine. They were on a tour. Uh, a tour. I'm trying to think who it was. Brother Wilson, they had a tour in Israel. And, um, and the guide was Jewish. And uh, so he was talking to Brother Walls. And he said, yeah, I, I know these people. He said, you know these people? Well, I know people like them. What do you mean you know people like him? Oh, I know him. They baptize in Jesus' name. They talk in tongues. Nah, 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 nah. He said they live holy. Women wear their dresses. Man. He said, no, you don't understand. These people, they don't even touch Hollywood. I know. None of them do. None of them do. He said, you know people like that? He said, yeah, a lot of my family are like that. They believe there's one God. They baptize in Jesus' name. He said, where are these people? He said, they're up north in Israel. He said, how many is there? About 150 of them, 200. He said, you're kidding. He said, no, I know where these people are. I'm not kidding. Well, honey, there's some there right now. I'm here to tell you we're in the last of the last days. There ain't no telling what we're going to see God do. There is no telling what we're going to see God do because God will pour out his grace and grace will bring repentance. Number two, it will impart great power and blessings. Acts 4.33 And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. We've seen that. Okay, number three, it brings salvation. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that hath appeared, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It imparts faith. Faith can be imparted and is imparted by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Acts 18, 27. And he was disposed to pass into Achaia. The brethren were exhorting the disciples to receive him. Who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. They had faith that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But that was through grace. Grace has the ability to impart faith in many ways just to give you an example as you know last weekend uh my dear wife was sick and she she was really sick and normally uh on the next day she would be better weak but she would be better well it was going into the night and she was still very very sick and she was talking to erica on the phone and uh joel and erica's kids and larry and sarah's kids they, they, were, they were traveling, and they, and they heard about it, and they all started praying. They, so they were praying, and they were crying. They were weeping for Nana, praying, God, heal Nana, heal Nana, heal Nana. And grace was on them, and they were pouring their hearts out. And then when they got done, they said to Sister Erica, Sister Booker said, don't get on the phone because Nana's going to call and tell us that God healed her. And just then the phone rang. And Erica answered the phone, and it was Sister Booker. She said, God touched me just now. God, just now touched. She didn't know they were praying. She didn't know that those kids said that. Now, that was grace on those kids. That was faith on those kids. And I want you to know, when, when she told them what God had just done for Nana, then they got grace for grace. <laughs> they got more grace. This is a neat kingdom. This is an awesome kingdom. We believe in that through grace. He gives us faith. Number five, 
grace can overcome sin. Romans 5.15, not but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. There is an offense that is born in us. We're conceived in sin, shaped in iniquity. The disease is there. I personally do not believe that uh, sin, I mean, babies uh, are born lost. But the disease is there. Somewhere, someplace, sometime, the disease manifests itself. Leprosy appears. The, the sin is committed. Accountability ages, all those things. God, I let God handle that stuff. I don't know how all that works. All I know is, is there is an offense passed through Adam. Well, guess what? There's a free gift passed through the second man, Adam. So, not, but not as offense, so also as the free gift. Oops. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift of by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. This grace gives us the ability to overcome. To overcome, to overcome. Amen. You can overcome nicotine. Grace can help you. I can tell you, you can overcome narcotic addiction. You can overcome pornography. You can overcome, because grace has the ability, amen, to, and I don't want to make this statement. If somebody's struggling with that stuff, turn your back, step away. And by the way, you need to listen to Pastor Booker's message on Wednesday night about social media. If you are not here, get the CD, go online and listen to it. But, amen, with anything, if you're away from a, 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 a cigarette for two days, three days, the longer you are away from it and the more you pray, the more grace snowballs, you can walk away from that. Amen. To where even the smell of it will make you puke. I used to love. I mean, to me, it was better than water. And the thought of it now would be like brine. It'd be like swallowing brine water. I can't even imagine. Why? What the change? The grace of God. On and on and on and on and on. Grace, 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 grace gives the ability to overcome all sin. Now, here is a paraphrase. Dark. And what a difference between our sin and God's generous gift of forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin. But this other man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many. Through God's bountiful gift. That's the new living. His bountiful gift. Amen. Grace can overcome the power of sin. Anybody thankful for grace? Anybody thankful for grace? Amen. Six. All right. Grace can reign. That means rule in a life if permitted. You have to permit it. He gives us free moral agency. You can say no to God anytime you want to, but you don't want to say no. Let grace reign in our life. Romans 5.21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, sin used to reign in our life, and it was taking us to the grave. It was taking us to hell. Sin hath reigned unto death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness. Amen unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace can reign supreme in a life and that life will be eternal by Jesus Christ. Grace can reign. It can make us one of God's elect. Romans eleven five and 6. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The point is, we do good because he gives us grace to do good. And we do good 
regardless of the amount of grace that's on us, we just go ahead and do what's right. And that gives us more grace for the next day and the next. And, 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 so, and then this reads, uh, here's another uh, paraphrase. So too, at this present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if chosen by grace, then it is no longer by works. By grace are you saved through faith. He chose us. We chose to respond. But he did choose us and we chose to respond. It's no longer by works. If it were chosen by works, grace would no longer be grace. I didn't just one day decide I'm going to live for God. God dealt with me. God dealt with you. You say, no, I didn't have no choice. I was raised in this. How many people were raised in this that chose to go otherwise? He never takes away the element of choice. Whether you're raised in this or not raised in this, somewhere, there's no grandkids in the kingdom. Everybody's first generation Pentecost. Everybody, and he moves, I believe on, I believe there's a day of visitation for everybody. How we handle that day of visitation. We, we, if we respond, ooh, that can go a long ways to help us the next time. Amen. So this business of grace, he, he works on us. He chooses us. Grace makes us one of God's elect. We can tell him no. We can frustrate it. But honey, there ain't nobody getting there without it. We have to respond to it. But it's grace that gets it there. Eight, grace gives power and changes lives. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, again, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace which was with me. It gives power to change lives. Grace Number nine, imparts spiritual riches. Spiritual riches come by grace. Ephesians 2, 7. Amen. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The sweet grace that he bestows upon us now. I'm telling you, when we cross the river... The exceeding riches. Now, there are exceeding riches of his grace all around us if we have eyes to see and ears to perceive. But when we get on the other side, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared. Exceeding riches throughout the ages. It gives endurance. Grace gives endurance. Second Corinthians twelve nine, And he said unto me, again, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace, he gives us the ability to endure. Grace can, you may think I'm stretching this one, but I'm going to tell you, grace even helps us to sing. Amen. Because in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, meaning read your Bibles. Listen to preaching and teaching. Get it down. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Grace helps you sing. If you don't believe that, listen to somebody sing with don't have grace. You got the picture. Grace helps us sing. Amen. Grace is strong. Grace gives strength. 2 Timothy 2 1. Uh, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace is strong and be strong in grace. Amen. It helps us in time of dire need. Hebrews 2 and 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's when he became man and dwelt among us. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God 
should taste death for every man. And when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, that man, Christ Jesus, that did not want to have his back beaten to where it looked like a plowed field, that did not want spikes driven through hands and feet, that did not want a man hair ripped from his face, that did not want a crown of thorns beat into his brow. This man said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Amen. And so by the grace of God, he went through Gethsemane. He went through the beating. He went through Pilate. He went through Herod's judgments halls. He went through all of that. He hung naked between heaven and earth as they passed by and mocked, covered with spittle and blood and water. He did it by grace. You see, he didn't have a choice. Listen, he said, don't you know I could right now call more than 12 legions of angels? He could have stopped at any time he wanted. But grace saw him through it. So he could taste and would taste and should taste death for every single one of us. And the grace that saw him through it. We'll see you through your bad report card. We'll see you through your demotion on the job. We'll see you, duh. He'll see us through. Amen. Grace gives stability. Um, Musicians begin to come. Hebrews 13 and 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. I never cease to be amazed at people grabbing and latching on to some really stupid doctrines. Diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Let the grace of God reign in your heart. Establish it. Let it establish the truth of God in your heart. It will strengthen you. It will give you stability. That you don't have to be carried about with every wind of doctrine that blows through the corridors. It gives beauty to life, even in families. Likewise, your husbands dwell with them. That's wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the, what a way to state it, the grace of life. You can be heirs together of the grace of life. It can be a beautiful thing. Because of grace. It can become abundant. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.14 And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Let's stand. 17. Brace, grace brings consolation and hope. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 I'm almost done. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Grace gives us consolation, everlasting consolation. Grace gives us hope. Grace gives us good hope. All this comes from grace. Anybody thankful for the grace of God? 18, grace is a teacher. Amen. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What does it do? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should, li- we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Anybody glad that grace is a teacher? It's a teacher of righteousness. It's a teacher of godliness. And it's an enabler of so. Amen. We're talking about the truth of grace and sanctification. 
so quickly. We see that grace brings men to repentance, imparts power and blessing, brings salvation, imparts faith, overcomes sin, reigns in a life, makes us one of God's elect. It empowers and changes lives. It imparts spiritual riches. It gives endurance. It helps us sing. It gives strength. It helps in time of need. It gives stability. It gives beauty to life. It can become, make life become abundant. Amen. It can become abundant. It gives consolation and hope. And it is a teacher. And I'm thankful for the grace of God. And one of the things that I pray all the time, amen, we all need the grace of God flowing powerfully. I pray two main things, almost every prayer meeting I start with this, when it comes to this church, this auditorium, this Inland Empire, I say, Jesus, fill this auditorium with your presence and grace. I beseech God, I beg God, fill this auditorium with your presence and your grace. Then I say, fill it with people. Fill it with souls. If it's full of people, but there's no grace, there's no presence of God, that ain't no fun at all. But you let God's grace, his presence fill this house. And then he fills it. And I pray it for this auditorium. I pray it for the one that's coming. I pray it, amen, for the school. I pray it for the Sunday school. I pray it when people drive by, let them feel the presence of God. I pray when they get out of their car, let them feel it stronger. I pray that when they closer they walk to the building, they feel it stronger. I pray when they come into the foyer, they feel it stronger. I pray when they come in the auditorium, they feel it even stronger. I pray when they hear the prayers of the people, they feel it even stronger. And that by the time altar call time comes, they feel it powerfully. The grace of God moving in their life. Without it, we're all sunk. With it, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens us. Let's lift our hands and love him. I love you, Jesus.